our hearts have felt the glory of the coming of the time when law and right and love and might shall make our land sublime when mountain hill and rock and rill with freedom's light will shine as truth comes marching on glory glory hallelujah glory glory hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah, the truth is marching on. They saw it in the shadows of the old New England Bay. They heard it in the breezes of that cold December day. They sent it with the echoes to Britannia far away. The truth was marching on. Columbia's daughters saw it when their brothers sprang to arms. They heard it in the booming of battle's rude alarms. They read it in the shadows of the dreary nights that comes. The truth was marching on. Last evening I heard the strangest sounds of a bird you call the loon. Calling and calling. And there was a total serenade. The chorus frogs and the peeper frogs and the loon. That was a symphonic welcome to this beautiful state of Minnesota. How fortunate you are to live here. My name is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and I'm here to speak to you about the women's suffrage movement in the 1800s. Two words, two important words, come to mind when I think of the women and the issues that affect us. One is equality, and the second word is justice. Firstly, I'll tell you a bit about myself and get that out of the way, for people always ask me, what about you? Well, I was born to a fairly well-to-do family. My father was a prominent lawyer. He, he was a politician in New York State. He served as a member of Congress, and he was on the New York State Supreme Court. When I was very young, I remember vividly the death of one of my brothers. Seeking my father's lap, and he rocked me back and forth. He said, Oh, Elizabeth, oh, Elizabeth, if only you were a boy. So I did my best to fill the void. I learned to play chess and rode horses. although my brothers went away to college. That was not an option open to girls. I studied Greek and mathematics and philosophy at Jonestown Academy, where girls could go to school. On completion of my studies, I spent a lot of time in my father's law office, reading briefs and law books and must confess, fairly often arguing with his interns. Often I would see people come in and they would leave in tears or total dejection. And I said to my father, well, what, what, what is going on? And he would reply, but Elizabeth, that is the law. But at that moment, I knew my mission in life was to better the situation for women and to be a part of challenging those laws. Well, when I was 25, I married Henry Stanton. Though I must say I deleted the OPA when the vows were to be taken. He was a very prominent and influential abolitionist speaker. We went 
to London on a honeymoon, but truly to attend the World Anti-Slavery Meeting that was being held in that city. Listen to this. None, not one, of the female delegates were allowed on the main floor. We were segregated up in the balcony behind a screen. I was enraged. I had previously met Lucretia Mott, a social act activist, abolitionist, Quaker woman. The Quaker believed in equality between men and women. And she and I decided that if we could not depend upon the men, then we would have to depend upon ourselves. But I want to get this straight. As a feminist, we are not anti-male. I was a devoted wife and mother of seven children. But I strongly feel that women must determine their own destiny. We must. So Lucretia Mott and a few other like-minded women, a number of years later, decided to hold a convention in Seneca Falls, New York. That was in 1848, a dozen years before the Civil War. That convention was all about two words. One, equality, justice. For who? For women. Laws were, the laws were such that women had no voice. Women were held under the authority of a father, a husband, or an eldest son. Laws must be changed to obtain our civil, political, and religious rights of women. I knew and Lucretia knew that we held the moral high ground. Rules were different for women and men. The rules were not the same. So at that conference, I was asked to write a declaration of sentiments. Now you will say, what is that? What did we want? It was, what did we want? What are we asking for? So I based that document on Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence that he had written 72 years previous. We believe these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. So what did we want? What is this all about? We wanted a right to an education. Is that too much to ask? How about university education? We wanted the right to own property, to own property in our own name. At that time, divorce laws turned a blind eye to domestic violence, to abuse and neglect. <coughs> we wanted to change that. custody of our own children, the children we gave birth to, we wanted custody. And if we worked, we wanted the right to keep our wages and to hold down a job. And how about if we're going to change the laws, how do we do that? We wanted the right to serve on jury, do, on jury duty. Serve on the juries to hold public office. And one more, a big one. How about the right to vote?
I knew that women would always, always be dependent until we hold the purse strings, a purse of our own. Throwing obstacles in the way of a complete education is like putting out the eyes. Why would we do that? It makes no sense. Women want to be free. And holding public office will allow us to speak for ourselves and to act on our own behalf. Give us voting rights and we will change those laws. All the resolutions passed at this in Seneca Falls except one. That one was the right to vote. Some individuals, in fact, quite a few individuals left the floor. They believed asking for the right to vote was simply too much to ask. It was then that my brilliant friend and former slave, Edward Douglas, stood up and spoke up, saying this, there can be no progress without struggle. Women must vote in order to change their situation. Right is of no sex. And the resolutions all passed. Soon after the convention, I met Susan B. Anthony. We bonded immediately. She was a Quaker a reformer, a powerful speaker, and a brilliant strategist. I wrote, and she spoke. I forged the thunderbolts, and she fired them. She always said to me, no man is good enough to govern any woman without her consent. Together with other like-minded women, we founded the National Women's Suffrage Movement. We were subjected to ridicule, told we did not know our place in society. We need to stay home and tend the children. Our behavior was unladylike, but we courageously fought on. And in 1861, Civil War and Reconstruction. In 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation. Slavery was abolished. We were overjoyed. Then came the 14th and 15th Amendments. Black men were given the right to vote. Needless to say, I was upset, very upset. And I told my friend, Frederick Douglass, exactly that. Brilliant man that he was, replied. Women, be patient. This hour belongs to the Negro. Susan B. Anthony and I worked together for over 44 years. We founded the Suffragist newspaper entitled The Revolution. We continued circulating petitions, lobbying Congress to pass a constitutional amendment to enfranchise women around the country. We wrote the history of women's suffrage. I wrote the Women's Bible and take great pride in publishing Solitude of Self, of which I will read you a short excerpt of Solitude of Self. In, in view of the entire disenfranchisement of half of the people of this country, our social and religious degradation, the unjust laws, women do feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, 
and deprived of our sacred rights. We insist that we have admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to us as citizens of the United States. I believe, you can tell how strongly I feel about this, I believe that we must, women, we must be the arbiter of our own destiny. I would have girls regard themselves not as adjectives, but as nouns. We must all rise and fall as one, for the best protection any woman can have is courage. And I will conclude with this. I never forget that we are sowing winter wheat. In the coming of spring, the wheat will sprout, and hands other than ours will reap and enjoy. I give you a very courageous woman, Alice Paul. I'm not used to speaking in a microphone, but it's really wonderful to be here with you in Park Rapids, Minnesota. I was the first born child to William and Tacy Paul in 1885 in Paulsville, New York. Our family of six was Quaker and lived with strong beliefs in nonviolence, social justice, and equality of the sexes. My father, from early on in my life, said that when there's a job to be done, I bank on Alice. My mother was a member of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, NASA, and often reminded me that when you put your hand to the plow, you can't put it down until you finish the row. Those were the guiding beliefs throughout my life as I dedicated myself to the single cause of securing equal rights for women. We children went to Hicksite Friends Quaker School, and I graduated first in the class in 1901. When Quaker schools were founded, one of their principles and still is equality of the sexes. Even so, when my mother married my father, she was not allowed to continue her education. Quaker suff suffragist Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott became my role models. In 1905, I graduated from Swarthmore College with a BA in biology. Professor Susan Cunningham, besides math, taught us to use thy gumption. 
some words that emboldened me as I worked on my passion of equal rights for women and playing field hockey and tennis and basketball too. After graduating, I worked on the settlement movement in New York City and then in Birmingham, England. One day, I happened on a crowd cheering and throwing things at the speaker. When the crowd broke up, I saw it was a woman and introduced myself to her. Christabel Pankhurst was advocating for women's rights and was the daughter of Emmeline, a militant suffragette. Her call to raise awareness was deeds, not words. Their actions at times led to imprisonment, something that I too experienced on behalf of their cause. Another phrase used by both Thomas Jefferson and Susan B. Anthony also inspired me. Resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. I brought with me from England their model of protest to the suffragist movement in the United States. Like my mother before me, I joined Nassau in 1912 and was named chair of the Congressional Committee. Along with my friend Lucy Burns, we organized our first public activity for suffrage. It was an arduous 295 mile march from New York City to Washington, D.C. We were joined by thousands of supporters along the way and arrived on March 3rd. Then, in 1913, a huge parade followed the, in New York City, calling for women's suffrage. It led to the first violent response men jeering and physically assaulting us while the police stood by watching. The next day we made the headlines across the nation and suffrage became a popular topic of discussion among politicians and the general public. Though we had used only legal activities of traditional democratic politics, we were frowned on by NASA leadership. We decided to form our own organization in 1914, the Congressional Union. By 1916, we became the National Women's Party and formed the Silent Sentinels. We stood silently, armed only with signs, at the White House gate in protest to President Woodrow Wilson's non-support of suffrage. When we continued the picketing after the start of World War I, we were arrested for obstructing traffic, and we were sent to the Akkoan workhouse in Virginia. We were political prisoners, but were treated as patients with mental illness. Conditions in the workhouse were horrible. We endured solitary confinement, mag maggot infested food, cold, rats, 
and lack of exercise. Several of us went on for a hunger strike in the name of our cause. After the first week, we were force-fed, choking on the tube put down our throats for nourishment three times daily for three weeks. When word got out about our ill treatment, the public demanded our release. It was quickly followed by President Wilson calling on Congress to support the suffrage amendment. Yes, he now declared it a war measure. The 19th Amendment finally passed Congress in 1919, and we traveled the nation by train. It had a banner declaring from prison to people. It also promoted the amendment's ratification by states and the election of candidates supporting the amendment. We maintained independence from political parties, but challenged the popular press who printed messages against suffrage. Finally, Tennessee Representative, 24-year-old Harry Byrne, on the plea of his mother, changed his negative vote and cast the amendment's winning vote. Tennessee, the last state needed, ratified the 19th Amendment, and women's right to vote was secured. Six days later, on August 18, 1920, Secretary of State Colby certified the ratification of the amendment. It took six days at that point. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. It was 72 years after the first call for suffrage had come from Seneca Falls, New York, the Women's Declaration of Sentiments. Yes, one woman can make a difference in the struggle for social justice. But my work for equal rights for women wasn't over. I'd earned an MA in sociology in 1907 and a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania in 1912, degrees in law from Washington College of Law at American University in 1922, and later a doctorate in 1928 but I still did not have equal rights with men. In 1923, on the 75th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention, I was successful in having the Lucretia Mott Amendment introduced into Congress, 1923. 49 years later, it passed Congress in 1972, it has since been ratified by the required 34 states, but must still be approved by Congress. When will the amendment become the law of the land, stating simply, Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied 
or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Now I'd like you to welcome my friend Lucy Burns. We'll share with her. Thank you. We'll share her experiences as a suffragist. Don't you all wish you were one? but one long struggle upward to equality. So wrote Elizabeth Cady Stanton in one of her memorable papers. Sadly, she did not live to see women gain the right to vote. It was a long fought for victory. The history of suffrage is filled with tragedy and triumph. And I am proud to have been part of that. I welcome this opportunity to share some remembrances. Hello, my name is Lucy Burns. I wouldn't expect you to know who I am. I'm much older now and haven't been involved in politics for quite some time. But in the early part of the 20th century, I was present at that momentous occasion in our nation's political history to help secure passage of the 19th Amendment. Being born into a large Irish Catholic family in Brooklyn in 1879, I was fortunate to have parents who both valued education and had the financial means to ensure I received a good one. After graduating Vassar College in 1902, I did postgraduate work at Yale and abroad in Germany and England, studying ling linguistics at Harvard, uh, I'm sorry, at Oxford. I wanted to get to Harvard. <laughs> Perhaps the fiery militant tactics of the Women's Social and Political Union in England appealed to my Irish sensibilities, for I left Oxford and secured a position as a salaried organizer for them. The police station and prison cells unfortunately became familiar places, but it was at a station one evening where I met the woman who would become a dear friend and partner in the suffrage movement, Ms. Alice Paul. I felt I met a kindred spirit, both of us passionate about enacting change. We returned to the U.S. in 1912 and joined the National American Suffrage, suffrage Association. Sadly, the movement seemed to have stalled in the States. We aim to revitalize it, bringing, dare I say, a more youthful energy and passion to the cause. Women's suffrage had last been debated by the Senate in 1887, 25 years previous, and had yet to reach the floor of the House. We knew we needed to do something big to bring new life to the cause, something dramatic, a parade. A march on Washington in support of the long dormant federal suffrage amendment. Organize pressure on a national scale, and what better time to hold it than the day before the presidential inauguration, March 3rd, 1913. Delegates, dignitaries, and journalists would be gathering. Made perfect sense to us, but this gave us just eight weeks to plan. That re event remains clearly etched in my mind. The press declared it both a ringing cry against injustice and a vibrant celebration of women's progress. We march in a spirit of protest against the present political organization of society from which women are excluded, announced our bulletin. A call went out across the country from suffrage group to suffrage group. Elizabeth Freeman and Rosalie Gardner-Jones organized a Bulls for Women pilgrimage from New York to Washington, D.C. to publish a, 
publicize the parade and appeal to newly elected President Woodrow Wilson to support the federal amendment. Their group joined thousands of other marchers, including men, on March 3rd. Our parade was rich with pageantry, costumes, 26 floats, dancers. Why, it was estimated that 6,000 to 8,000 women took part. Inez Mulholland led the procession, dressed beautifully and imposing in a white broadcloth suit and long white kid boots mounted on a white horse. She symbolized the free women of the future and embodied the energy of the renewed movement. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Came her battle cry. Sadly, I must acknowledge that our suffrage fight focused solely on white women. Looking back, I must acknowledge the president prejudices and ignorance within our leadership, allowing fear of offending Southern suffragists to dictate our actions. But courageously, black women boldly joined the parade, even when told they would have to march in the back. Ida B. Wells, however, proudly marched up front with her state delegation. The parade was a demonstration of the worldwide progress of women's suffrage over the past 65 years. One series of floats showed women working alongside men in the field, the factory, and all other areas of life, except the halls of government. While the majority of spectators were supporters, we were met by a hostile mob at one point, hurling vulgar, obscene language, which seemed to just amuse the police. It took, took us three hours to cover one mile, and some feared all would be lost. When we did make it to the Treasury Building, a vibrant dance performance awaited us. I can still picture the dancers in their costumes representing Columbia, Liberty, <coughs> Justice, Charity, Hope, Peace, and Plenty. Our procession concluded with a rally at Continental Hall. Oh yes, Alice, you and I made quite the team. She was the focus executive with her charismatic personality. We raised money and attracted publicity. Why, in the 12 months following that first parade, we raised over $27,000. That was a large sum in 1913. And more importantly, we kept a single-minded focus on that federal amendment. Alas, the National Association did not support our efforts for federal action. They preferred a state-by-state -state approach. So Alice and I formed the Congressional Union Still part of the National Association at first, but separately organized and, fund, and funded. And as Alice mentioned, by early 1914, our two organizations officially split. I spent some time in California organizing women voters there and became editor of the CU's paper, The Suffragist. In June 1916, we formed the National Women's Party. Our primary goal was passage of that federal amendment, of course. Even though we had far fewer members than the two million claimed by the National American Suffrage Association, we commanded the attention of politicians and the public through relentless lobbying, repeated acts of nonviolent confrontation and civil disobedience, including picketing the White House, which we kept up for months. We were arrested over and over. And along with Alice and other women, I was sent to the workhouse. Though that charge was obstructing justice, we demanded to be seen as political prisoners. Our imprisonment was due to our beliefs, not any criminal activity. As, again, Alice talked briefly about the 
sinister horrors in that workhouse, the brutality and dread. But we continue to work hard, organizing and rallying, this time just from within prison walls. We refuse to work unless granted access to writing materials and contact with the outside. They put us in solitary confinement. We were beaten, stripped, even handcuffed and forced to hang from the cell bars. During an organized hunger strike, Alice and I were bru brutally forced back. But we continued to fight back, as did scores of other women. When news of our treatment by the guards was leaked, our supporters protested in one of the largest and most dramatic picketing campaigns in November 1917. And it was that publicity around our treatment that finally moved President Wilson to act. And in May 1919, the House passed the amendment and the Senate followed in June. Oh, Alice, you said it best. Freedom has come not as a gift, but as a triumph. Once the right to vote was secured, I retired from political life. Frankly, I was tired. And those months in prison had taken their toll. I didn't want to do any more fighting. We had sacrificed everything we possessed, let others fight. Now I was done. So I've been back home in Brooklyn, helping to raise an orphan niece and spending much needed time with family. Alice remained in the political arena, working hard for an Equal Rights Amendment. It goes without saying, we still need to see more women working in government and being paid accordingly. We had hoped that, women's, that Minnesota's first woman le women's legislator, Koya Knudsen, would be here today. But unfortunately, she had urgent business to attend to in Washington and was unable to attend. But I understand there is a very fine exhibit here highlighting those ongoing struggles towards equality. So please enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And I thank you for your attention.